UFC 305 just ended and it was an amazing card. It was honestly entertaining from the start to the very end and it capped off with a crazy exciting main event between Drickus Duplessis and Israel Adesanya and I told you always bet on blue and gold because Freemasons don't lose in the UFC, especially not when it comes to title fights. So what did I think about each fight on the card? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I was live for the entire event, so if you want to see any of my reactions, you can check out my live stream, it's pinned in the description of this video, or you can check out the new up-and-coming Rego Clips channel that has posted a Rego reacts to all KOs from UFC 305. What an absolute beauty. More of my viewers need to be like this guy and start clipping me. All right, but I went great on this card. I had an amazing card. Both my dogs hit. So I went eight and four altogether, but both my dogs hit. Jesus Aguilar getting that first round submission over the hype train Stuart Nickel. And then Walter Walker, first round submission over Bum Tafa, right? And then I also got my main event last minute pick flip. I switched my pick from Izzy to DDP during fight week. First time I've ever done it on my channel. And it paid off because I do not pick flip lightly and I do not pick against Freemasons in title fights. Drickus Duplessis versus Israel Adesanya in the main event was a great main event. Izzy fought an excellent fight and he was trending to win that fight on the scorecards. I think he was up at the time he got subbed or at least it was to be honest he was like winning that round and Drakus was like getting the crap beaten out of his stomach and stuff like he wasn't getting damaged too too much up top but Izzy was working that body like a motherfucker and honestly Drakus would just do these like uh, like you could just see it was hurting and then he'd just take a big breath come forward and he'd like connect with something I don't know how Izzy was getting hit by that Izzy did look slow in terms his hands looked quick and his kicks were still okay and stuff, but his footwork and just movement, the head movement, the reaction time seemed slow. And it seemed like he was maybe even a little bit shocked that these shots from Drickus were coming through. Drickus is also a hard guy to fully like lean back against whatever because he's just going to come at like you from weird angles. But listen, Izzy fought an excellent fight. It seemed like his boxing had improved and Drickus showed an excellent heart he showed that grit and determination and the masonic spirit that you can't pick against and that's why i had to pick Drickus duplessis when i saw this guy come out with the blue and gold diamonds all over his jacket and you know all the other masonic stuff that this guy does i just realized this is a new alex Pereira. they're gonna pump this guy up he's going to do what they want for them he's gonna follow the script to a t and I knew that Izzy was crying at the press conference, not because he was emotional about anything Drickus had said, but because he was emotional that his time as the lead actor, his time in the anime was up and he was getting written out of the anime. And that's what happened at UFC 305, guys. What we saw was Izzy was written out of the anime. And I would like to say, uh, first of all, great performance from Drickus, just showing that absolute heart when he was arguably down on the scorecards to know he needed that finish and to get that finish. And he rear naked choked Izzy out in the fourth, right? It was a, a phenomenal finish. And Izzy put on an excellent fight. It was not like an easy fight for Drickus by any means. So Drickus really showed championship grit. I also really liked that both guys were absolute sportsmen in victory and defeat. Drickus was absolutely like polite and gentlemanly on the mic afterwards. They didn't try to bait Izzy into any other thing, into continuing the beef or anything. He even said a line like, no matter who won tonight, all of Africa would have won. And uh, Izzy also showed a lot of humility and grace in his defeat, did not cope on the mic, gave Drickus all his credit 
uh, he really had to because Izzy was fighting a great fight. So uh, you have to give Drickus his credit there. And he also said uh, he's not going anywhere. He knows everyone wants him to retire and stuff like that. But he's going to come back and win some more fights. So shout out Izzy and shout out Drickus for just essentially squashing the beef. I think they said they're both going to go out with each other in Perth. So little date, little DDP and Izzy date there. Uh, it's good that they become friends because I always said this. I think they're the reason that they triggered each other so much and that they had such a fierce rivalry was because they identified in each other things that they disliked in themselves. They really saw a mirror in the opposite fighter. And uh, sometimes all you need to do is just throw down and you will find that, that the guy you are the biggest rival with becomes your best friend. So I am here for the Izzy DDP bestie arc. Let's talk about the co-main event. Um, hey, Ursek sucks. 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 Why did I let Ursals gaslight me into thinking he actually had a somewhat decent performance against Pantoja when I was one of the original people saying he sucked against Pantoja. He lost four rounds. He, he didn't make one mistake in the fifth that cost him that fight. He was not winning that fight no matter what. He made 50 mistakes and he was outclassed. Why did I let brain dead Bogans from Western Australia convince me that their prospect is any good? Because he's not. He looked so freaking horrible against Kai Kara France, who is not a champ at the end of the day. He's a high-ranked and uh, flyweight and a highly skilled flyweight. And I do think that uh, Kai proved that. And Ty Kai had a great performance. And he fought an excellent, excellent first round. He barely took any shots. He had Ursag frozen up basically unwilling to throw, and then he caught him with coming in like with that overhand, but he caught him with the hook. It wasn't even much, it wasn't even, it wasn't even perfectly placed, but right on that weak chin of Ursag, Ursag crumples like a sack of potatoes, and he did get up, but he got dropped again up against the cage. Some follow-up shots on the guard, it was waved off, a lot of Ursag's crying, uh, early stoppage, Ursag sucks, and it was a perfectly, totally fine stoppage. What do you want to see him go uh, fully unconscious in front of his home crowd or something like that? He was out. He was not in. He wasn't even throwing punches before that. What's he going to do? Suddenly hail Mary a win or throw up? Like, you know, no. Kai Car France had a good performance. Kai Car France acted like a sportsman uh, in victory. He usually does, though. He's not a bad winner or a sore winner. Or, you know what I mean? Like an arrogant winner. And uh, I know I uh, am a Kai Car France hater at the end of the day, but it's mainly the issues with the Maori LARPing I'm not a fan of. Uh, he fought a great fight, good performance, and he put that nerd cell out. So I'm happy with the outcome of that. Okay, so we had Mateusz Gamrot from Poland, soon to be from hell, if I have anything to do with it, if I can get my hands on him, versus Dan Hooker, all right? And uh, Chad, Dan Hooker, did what very few people thought he could do, and anyone who did pick Dan Hooker on the chance that he's going to get the more effective striking in this fight and uh, mitigate Gamrot's takedowns, you had a spot-on pick, and I'm jealous of that fight analysis because I was so high on Gamrot. I locked him. I put a bunch of money on him. I know people people put a lot of money. There are people who are putting big, big, big money on Gamrot, dude, and he just crapped the bed, could not get his takedowns going. I mean, he didn't even try in the first round, and he arguably was winning that round until he got dropped by Hooker, but then just the fight went away from him, man, and uh, Hooker was winning. It was a good fight. It was like a competitive back-and-forth fight, and Gamrot was in there showing chat, but he was getting like wobbled, dropped, like, like a lot, and there was very little he was able to do at that point to really pull ahead it wasn't like it was a five round fight or something so um at the end of it I was like Hooker won this and to give a scorecard to Gamrot in my opinion was unjustifiable like I don't really think he deserved a, a judge's scorecard and you know who else didn't deserve a judge's scorecard tied to Avasa that was a pity scorecard I hope that guy was on a phone to the other judges and was like you guys scored this for Jarzina right okay okay I'm just gonna give this to Ty to make him feel better because it did lift Ty's spirits but Ty 100% lost that Jarzina fight shouldn't have been a split um, if anything, like the Kulabau Ramos fight, which we'll talk about a little bit later, was like one of the only justifiable splits on the card, uh, I believe. Just going over, like, from my memory right now. Uh, this fight was not a split. Jorginho clearly took it. And you know what's very funny is I switched my Protez pick, which we'll talk about in a second, from KO, second round, to decision, because I'm like, he might struggle with the leech and go long. And I switched my Jorginho pick from decision against Ty to first round KO because I thought Ty would push the pace and force Jarzinho to engage. But no, the fights actually went how I originally thought in the uh, earlier in the week where Jarzinho 
and Ty fought slow in the first round. And, you know, there's some more changes in the second and stuff like that. But uh, once again, I thought Ty lost that fight. And good win for Jarzinho. Good win for Biggie Boy at the end of the day. So speaking of the card opener, Pratez versus Leach, I switched my pick. I had a second round KO for Pratez. But then I was like, dude, the Leach is insanely durable. And I can see Pratez struggling with him a little bit. Nope. Nope. I mean, it was a slow first round. A lot of reads, you know, being downloaded by both guys. Uh, Pratt has really figuring out the distance, though, and really letting Leach, like, settle into a predictable circling out like, to the left pattern and stuff like that. And then in that second round, he just walked him down, got him into the fence, and was having him essentially do that circle against the fence, landed a nice hook a couple times because Leach didn't go down from the first crazy bomb. And that's what I want to say about Pratis, man, is, yeah, the guy has not the nicest record. He's like 20 and 6 now after that Leach win and, you know, some regional losses and smokes cigarettes in his camp and drinks beer during his camp. And maybe if he gets more screwed in, he's got insane power, insane reach, insane frame. For the division. He called out Chaos Williams, who I think he'd absolutely spark. He's too clean and technical, uh, too rangy, too good in that first to be really at much risk from Chaos. And I think he just puts him out. And uh, he's going to be a problem for other guys. He's got, he's arguably the hardest hitting 170 right now. Uh, maybe besides Kalen Williams or something. But with his actual like precision, Pratis is more powerful than JDM, guys. JDM has nice, nice, nice boxing combinations. They can really string them together. And you can get the knees off and stuff too, just like Pratis is. But let's just talk about hands here for a second. Pratis has harder hands than JDM. He has better one-shot KO power. Really, 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 really good placement. And I don't know. I'm high on Pratis. I hope he can screw in a little bit in the... Maybe take it a little bit more serious now that he's getting up here. But it seems like he's already been doing that. He's training with the fighting nerds. Fighting nerds are up big, right? I liked it. I liked the performance. It was a very fun uh, way to start the car. First time was a little bit boring, but it totally picked up. And it uh, set the pace for what turned out to be a great main event. UFC 305 was undeniably a great main event. I did get my Walter Walker dog pick to hit over t Junior Toffer. Dustin Toff, whatever, whatever, one of the Toffas, and uh, I just knew Walter, first of all, he made me feel very confident in him with how he looked at uh, weigh-ins and stuff, and he got that, a nice, like, heel hook or whatever it was, he rolled for a leg against Toffa, and Toffa verbally submitted, he screamed like a little girl, and a bunch of people would try, that's not, no tap, the, the ref's terrible stoppage, it's, the ref would lose his job, what's he gonna do, let people scream, uh, involuntary pain responses as their leg is getting torqued and possibly crippled and bro's just screaming and oh what, what what are we supposed to do what are we supposed to do the ref can literally stop a fight from an involuntary pain response if you get punched if you get punched and scream the ref can stop it so you are supposed to control your in well first of all that's an involuntary pain response it's like Passing out, falling unconscious. These are things that the ref are, is allowed to take into account to stop a fight. Or, hey, a voluntary thing, turning your back on your opponent. Shut up. Anyone complaining about that? It was a great win from Walter Walker. You're just salty because you didn't pick the Chad, Giga Chad, Walter Walker. The better of the Walker bros. And uh, I'm not one of those dummies. Kulabao versus Ramos was a very close fight. I do think Kulabao made some fight IQ uh, errors in this fight that cost him it. He very well could have got the finish, excuse me, in the second, but he chose to just sit around, like, dancing around Ricardo after he had dropped Ricardo with low kicks and just, like, try to kick him from down there instead of forcing him to get up. When he had watched Jack Jenkins do this similar thing earlier in the night where he had dropped his opponent with low kicks and kept uh, Herbert Burns and kept forcing him to get up, and Herbert eventually just got quit because he couldn't get up so Joshua Kalubao is showing extremely poor IQ moves when he literally had the like reminder a few fights before to do this if you drop bro with low kicks Kalubao arguably lost that fight like it's not wrong to have given it to Ricardo Ramos so uh this like I said earlier was the only real justifiable split on the card in my opinion and it was a really close fight uh, anyone who did have Ramos there uh, probably sweating at times, but good pick at the end of the day. And then we had Casey O'Neill versus Luana Santos. I picked Luana Santos. She did not. Her bunda let me down, bro. And I forgot the power of Casey's bunda at the end of the day. Casey looks like she has been training and then trying to improve her hands a little bit. Absolutely. Not a little bit, but a lot. She was uh, Her boxing looked nice and stuff like that. She was um, 
winning like in the clinches and the scrambles a lot too. Luana didn't really do much. Luana looked outclassed. And, you know, some people are saying Luana probably not taking this fight super seriously. She didn't take a short notice and uh, maybe she thought she'd be able to run through Casey or something or maybe she was just taking it for a paycheck. I don't know. Don't know about the mentality there, but uh, it was a totally fine win for uh, Casey. So good for her. And uh, Jack Jenkins versus Herbert. I just talked about this a little bit, but basically Jack Jenkins looked excellent. He, he looked excellent. He put on a pure performance. Yeah, he um, took a little bit long to finish Burns. Uh, I didn't think he got him out there in the third, right, uh, right in the third, but um, he just worked up. He was working a jab. Was, his jab was really nice in the, in the first, and he, you know, he was working his low kicks, just building up into everything, nice body work and stuff. And uh, His boxing looks really nice, Jack Jenkins. It looked really, really nice. He did get taken down by Burns at, at one point. I believe it was in the second, but, uh, or no, it was at the end of the first. And then, whatever, Jack Jenkins just started to come alive, come alive. Burns started to quit, started to quit, and Jenkins was breaking him down, breaking him down. He got that low kick TKO, essentially, where he just kept dropping Burns with calf kicks. And then Burns, after one of them, just refused to get up. He just pretended. He like put a, you know, didn't even actually try. So uh, it was a real quit thing, but it wasn't like it was a bad performance from Jack Jenkins or anything. Unlike Tom Nolan, who honestly had a terrible performance. This Tom Nolan guy being a bigger favorite than... Jack Jenkins, or, you know, uh, I guess, Prates, or whatever, is crazy, because he fought like an absolute pick em bomb. This fight was closer than Skulabau versus Ramos, almost, and Reyes absolutely in there the entire time, you know, a lot of people disrespecting Ramos, saying he's gonna get chinned any way he wants, Tom Nolan can beat him any way he wants, well, Tom Nolan's an absolute buff, like, he's not good, he does not have good fight IQ, he constantly overextends himself, overexposes himself, coming in for, like, offensive blitzes, he's so he's just stupid and anyone who's better and not like as ring rusted and just like you know a 37 year old guy with 18 fights like Alex Reyes or 17 at the time of this and a bunch you know has hasn't won a fight in like seven years like bringing you to a decision like that like great fight by Reyes showing that he's not really over the hill if you're friggin making 24 year old prospects look like absolute bombs um because he looks like a bomb this time, the only guy. He got rocked in the first round, too, or whatever. I think caught on a chin. Like, he's just a bomb. Now, Sonkin Han versus Rick Glenn. Sonkin Han looked, I don't know, jet lagged or something in the first round. So slow. And Ricky Glenn, who fights slow, come out, landed like the slowest overhand. Like, he was like just blitzing those, like, and like overhand left hook things, right? Like the fake overhand lefts to takedowns. And then he got one, though. It landed on the button of, uh, Song and Song just like fell in slow motion, almost looked like he accepted guard. He totally lost the first round, in my opinion, but some judges did give it to him. And then Song uh, Kinan just came alive in the second, though. He absolutely entered the matrix, dude. He was landing crisp, snappy straights down the middle, busting up Glenn, working his jab. It was nice. Song Kinan was even starting to get the better of the scrambles and just defend the takedowns. And uh, this fight went to a decision, but. So on Kinan dominated it. I, I think he did get a couple 30-27 or I think he even got a 30-26 scorecard, actually. So good win from old song there. And then our card opened with Jesus Aguilar versus Stuart Nickel. Jesus Aguilar got a disgustingly tight guillotine. He got taken down by Stuart and was making me sweat because I picked Aguilar as a dog. Nickel took him down and was like able to take the back and all this stuff. But then they scrambled and uh Stuart Nichols, like, jumped up too high on Aguilar's back, I believe. Fell off, but then Aguilar went back in there. They scrambled again. Aguilar jumped guillotine, and I was like, he's such an idiot. He had the ability to get out of here, bring this fight back to the feet. He's not an idiot. He knew exactly what he was doing. He latched up one of the tightest guillotines I've seen in a minute. Stuart was out fully cold, and the Chaparito gentleman, Jesus Aguilar, stood up and shook his legs to bring him away. So it was a great win. Like I said, I had two dogs cash. Jesus Aguilar, Walter Walker went eight and four in general. And I had the main event hit as well with Draco. So it was a great card for me. Uh, really saved my reputation. If you want to see any of my live reactions to the fights, you can find the link to the live stream I did for the event in the description of this video. And I'll also link the new Rigo Clips channel, who is starting to clip reactions and funny moments from the stream. So shout out Rigo Clips channel. If you want to see a shorter version of those uh, highlights, check his channel out. You didn't go on vacation yet, did you? I am the leading occult expert on MMA YouTube. It's Rigo Mad, Rigo Mad Dog. Every time I see Norma Dumont's dump truck, I get disgusting, lustful urges. Yo, I have a sensitive stumpy, dude. There's a little thing called the war on terror. That's what fucking pisses me off, dude. 
That's what fucking pisses me off! And let me give a shout out to the winner of this week's topology event. So the winner of this week's topology was How Chilled. And actually, Eagle MMA coming in there as second. Great picks from Eagle there. But I'll throw a screenshot of like the top 10 guys in here. And uh, let me just tell you what the topology is. It's basically a fantasy MMA picks group where you just compete with the other like 900 members. We have a very big group and see whose picks are the best uh, based on points and accuracy. It's free to play, free to join, just a fun way to make uh, fun cards like UFC 305 a little bit more fun and maybe some boring cards like Apex cards actually enjoyable. So if you want to join, you can find the link to that in the description of this video as well. I'd like to thank all you guys for watching this video and anyone who was in my fight companion and uh, stuff. It was really fun. Hop into my fight companion for the next UFC event and any of the streams I'm doing this week. If you like the video, drop a like on it. Subscribe if you're new and turn the bell notification on so you don't miss a single thing. I'd like to give a big thank you to all my channel members and a special thanks to my Lions here members. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Demon Bobby. Demon Mommy.